everybody. Welcome to the Fire It Up with CJ show. Today we are lucky enough to have Carl Greer here again, and this time he is talking about this book, The Necktie and the Jaguar, a mem- memoir to help you change your story and find fulfillment. So welcome back, Carl. Thank you, CJ. Good to be with you. Okay. Um, one of the things that you did the last time we spoke, which I love, 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 was you did an invocation. So I was wondering if for our viewers, myself and you, if you can do an invocation um, that seems, you know, to bring all the spirits in with this conversation so we can um, do what the spirits have asked us to do, whatever that may be. We'd glad to. Um, I'll do an invocation from some Andean traditions. <clears throat> We're in the south. I'm going to bring in the energy of the anaconda and to help us move beyond the wounds that we might have from our childhoods. The west, the energy of the jaguar to help us move between the worlds of conscious and unconscious, living and dying. The north, the energy of the hummingbird, which connects us to our spiritual lineages and natures. And then in the east, the place of putting it all together, the energy of the eagle or the condor, a place of perspective and bringing our new uh, knowledge into the world. And then we honor the below, the Mother Earth, the mother of all that we are right now. And then Father Sky, the whole universe, the mysteries that have created all that we're part of. Mm. So, to the winds of the south, such a mama, wrap your quarrels of light around us and teach us to shed our past the way you shed your skin. Teach us to walk softly on the earth and teach us your beauty ways, Mother Ho. The winds of the west, Adorango, Mother Jaguar, protect this space as CJ and I do our work today. Show us the way between worlds, living and dying, conscious and unconscious. Help us to move beyond our fears as we visit those places. The winds of the north, hummingbird, great journeyer. You teach us the lessons of being still in the midst of our busyness and appropriately active in the midst of our stillness. You are a guide to finding our spiritual natures, those who have come before us and those who will come after us, our children's children. To the winds of the east, Apuchin, Great Eagle Condor, you give us perspective and help us to bring into our lives the lessons that we learn when we do metaphysical work. Pachamama, Mother Earth, We thank you for being part of your plan. Help us to recognize our interconnections with all of your creations, the plants, the stones, the animals, the humans. And great spirit, sky spirits, sun, moon, stars. Help us to be present to your mysteries and we are so grateful to be part of your plan. Ho. Mm. Beautiful. So my question for you is, um, when you do this invocation and you think about all these spirits that have blessed your life, how do you see these winds, north, south, east, west, above, below, shaping your life? I believe that uh, we all came from some place which I call the quiet. It's a place uh, before creation, before an idea, the form of the idea, before the energization of an idea. And from this, all things that we see in this universe and all the other universes, which I believe uh, exist, uh, are present, including 
uh, what I would call these archetypal energies, these energies of plants and animals and spirits. So what I'm calling in this particular set of, of archetypal energies, I'm calling it energies that are all part of the one, but have specific meanings for me and for those who work with them. And respectfully, I'm just honoring them, acknowledging them and asking them for the work that I'm doing right now to be present. Mm. So that's how I think about it. They're, they're allies. And uh, like with all allies, you want to be respectful of them and, and ask them periodically, what can you do for them as well as what they can do for you? Mm. I, I wanted to talk about your life right now as, um, and I, I'm not sure where, I'm not sure where you are in terms of age. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I'm 81. You're 81. Oh, you look fabulous. Yeah. Okay. Shamanism has done you well. <laughs> okay. So at 81, um, many people your age are really fearful of COVID. There are all this, there's this time where I would say, generally speaking, we have gone outward without the, really the desire to go inward to the quiet. So we've had this opportunity over the last um, stretch of time to go inward and um, confer with our own allies, whoever they may be, and to be guided. Um, I'm wondering when you have tuned into your own guidance during this juncture in crazy chaotic time that we're in, um, how your guides have helped you and what you've learned about this very moment that we're in right now, the Delta variant potentially giving us another cycle of going in again. Um, right before COVID uh, started in January, before it started, uh, I had uh, open heart surgery. And, oh, my uh, goodness. They, uh, you know, cut me open and put me in the heart-lung machine and uh, replaced uh, three arteries on the left side of my heart that had been completely blocked. They couldn't put a stent in. Mm. <clears throat> uh, at the time, I had had uh, watchful waiting for prostate cancer. So I was aware of my possible mortality. Mm. I got out of the hospital and back home, started to recuperate before March when the COVID, you know, really hit and everybody had to, you know, stay in place pretty well. So it was a time for me, CJ, to start to reflect on where I've been, where I'm going, how much more time I might have uh, later on last year. I, uh, my prostate cancer had uh, got more aggressive, and so I had uh, a series of uh, radiation treatments. So I was spending some time being careful about COVID, sometimes, you know, trying to take care of some of these things that were, you know, life-threatening. Uh, and at the same time, trying to be present to my life, and my family, oh. and my business things, my healing practice, my philanthropic activities. I was trying to keep everything going, uh, but aware that at any time, more aware than ever, it can be taken from me. So it was a time of realizations, but also of appreciation for mm. what I... Mm. And what were the realizations that you had about both life and death during this time? Uh, that I was very fortunate. That I've, I've been lucky to have a, a life that's lasted this long. And uh, all but one of my relatives died earlier than I did. So I was really feeling uh, a lot of gratitude. And I wanted to find ways to make the best of the time that I have left. Mm -hmm. And what does that mean for you? Like, what? how do you make the best out of the time that you have left right now? Uh, I've had a number of chapters in my life. Uh, one thread through that has been I've had some, you know, financial success mm -hmm. that has allowed me to ask the question, what do I want to do with that? Mm. And beyond uh, taking care of my 
family, uh, immediate and extended, and being sure that they're going to be provided for. Uh, I've decided I want to give it away. Mm. And as much as I can in my lifetime, I want to do that, not just by writing checks, but trying to give some of my insights and learnings to those charities with which I work. Mm. So that's been a big focus for me and will continue to be to make a difference by helping those uh, in need. And specifically, it's the people who, in my opinion, have had uh, uh, not the best hand dealt to them Mm -hmm. for no fault of their own. And so I have scholarships from people for underserved communities uh, for kids to go to school and STEM programs, Mm -hmm. Uh, battered women, uh, vets who have PTSD, Mm -hmm. the home. Uh, people who uh, suffer from cancer and other chronic diseases that can kill them. Uh, uh, Medical research beyond just allopathic medicine, but uh, getting into more integrative kind of medicine. So those are all fields plus more that interest me. And uh, as I spend the time and resources that I have left, uh, it makes me happy to do that. Hmm. So um, I read here that you have uh, 60 charities <laughs> yeah. that you're supporting. So does that mean yeah. you're, you funded over 60 charities that fulfill some of this, what do I do with my money so that I can leave yeah. the world a better place? Um, and you have over 600 Greer scholars who are the people that you said um, you give scholarships to do STEM. Um, how has your shamanic journey and practices guided these investments? I mean, how did, you know, cause usually with a philanthropic plan, you need to have some kind of guiding principles with what the, you know, which 60, how, how, what are the levers to pull to create the greatest impact? How did you come up with the 60? Well, I had a desire to help kids who otherwise might not be able to get good degrees uh, in STEM programs. Mm -hmm. And now, as a matter of fact, it's probably more than 900 Mm. kids Mm -hmm. past and present that are Mm -hmm. in in these programs. So that was just one desire that I had. Uh, Many years ago, in a place where I was working doing uh, uh, psychological uh, work, uh, we had a presentation by somebody from a battered women's group. Mm. And that really, uh, struck me as uh, the horror of being a woman mm-hmm. and uh, being beaten by your husband. Mm. And so we now work with more than 10 groups that serve and help battered women and their children. Mm. Uh, so in part, it was just what crossed my path and the path of my wife. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then from those seedlings, I was able to expand uh, around them. And I met people in different parts of the world that I was traveling, you know, doing shamanic work. And mm. just synchronistically, you know, when you have kind of a intent to do stuff, mm-hmm. stuff just comes your way. Mm. And fortunate to that. And uh, not all of them do I actively get involved to make changes or suggestions. But a lot of them I do. Mm. You know, some I've supported and I'm a, I talk to the executive directories, but some I really spend more time asking uh, what they do, how they do it, uh, have they thought about this, what about that, and so on and so forth. Mm. And then maybe we'll challenge them to, to make a difference, and I'll support that as they try. So what's interesting is you um, you got this money through your very fir- your, your job in the, is it in the oil business that you got mm-hmm. the money? And can you tell us a little yeah. bit about that? that foundation, foundational piece and how you even arrived there to begin with? Well, I, uh, I grew up in the Midwest, uh, you know, uh, the, during World War II. So I was affected by the culture around me. Mm-hmm. And that culture said a man should aspire to get a job, raise a family, uh, and have a best job you could get. And that's what I thought would be my destiny. Mm-hmm. And to that end, uh, I had to put aside 
uh, stirring inside of me that were more, uh, as I called them in the book that I wrote, uh, mythopoetic, you know, kind of my search for spiritual meaning and things. I didn't think that was practical. So I went to college, studied engineering, and a uh, meddler engineer is, you know, kind of as far away from that as you can <laughs> imagine. Although metallurgical engineering has ties to alchemy, which mm. at the time I wasn't aware of. Uh, and, and I almost, uh, my senior year, decided to switch into uh, clinical psychology. And I thought, well, that's not very practical. So I ended up going to Columbia University Graduate School of Business and uh, ended up getting my doctorate there and teaching there. From there... Wait, in, in, uh, your, so you got your MBA at Columbia, but then, no, you got your you psychology. Got, no, I got my PhD in, in finance and management. I taught okay. in a business school. Oh, wow. I taught in a business school, yeah, for, you know, nine semesters. Wow. And uh, then from there, I ended up coming to Chicago because I had taught an extra long load, and uh, I was on, a, like, a sabbatical. So I had nine months. I was on Columbia's payroll. I came out to Chicago to a company called Martin Oil, and the founder uh, had cancer. Uh, and uh, 15 months after I came, he died, and I became the president wow. at age 28. Wow. Age until now, I've been, part of my life has been with that company. So we have been in the oil business and banking and real estate and uh, still warehousing and manufacturing and all, all kinds of things. And so it's uh, a which, conglomerate that has many parts of many was, likes. To it, it was, it, it was, but, but much of it now has been sold and I'm just kind of finishing up that phase in my life. But I've had some time in the last 20, 30 years to do other things as I've unwound that. But I've been there for 50 four years now still wow. in the wow. office that I'm in this interview uh, I'm doing that so the resources that I was able to accumulate for myself and my partners now I'm deciding what do I want to do with those and I really would like to be as impactful to help these causes that I'm describing mm. between now and the time that I have left so that's mm. how that story unfolded mm. and when you're you said that when you were in college, you wanted to be a clinical psychologist because ultimately yeah. you were looking for spiritual meaning. How yes. did that get incorporated simultaneously while you're running this gigantic company? For for a while, it didn't. You know, my uh, my spiritual side was uh, fed a little bit, well, more than a little bit. In times I could spend in nature, mm -hmm. you know, I like to be water i like to fish for example mm -hmm. and I like to be outside so i was able to incorporate some of that in my life and uh, i had always been interested in the martial arts mm -hmm. and yeah uh, it kind of the, the spiritual underpinning of those martial arts uh, started to you know feed me at some levels then at one point i got interested uh, quite a bit into qigong so i was in qigong and then a lifelong interest has had been shamanism so when I was uh, about 60, uh, I formalized that interest. I had prior to that, uh, you know, read books and done some things, but uh, I started to study it. And uh, I, my first trainings were with uh, Alberto Viado. Mm -hmm. I ended up teaching at uh, his school for a while and then uh, uh, became friends with him. And then I spent a lot of time around the world with other shamans in the last 21 years. So mm. uh, that got incorporated into my life. And to tie it into your question, that sense of the interconnectedness of all things and the responsibilities that we all have at some level to all things, uh, shamanism helped me to crystallize that feeling within myself and to motivate me and kind of help me and guide me to do something about it, which mm. is how I got to where I am now. It, it, not completely my shamanism, but it's all these steps were part of it. So now I've had to integrate all these different parts of my life and, uh, uh, and continue to do so. Mm. Yeah, that's, um, 
You know, it's, you're probably one of the few oil executives that have taken all your money and going to be taking, you know, taking care of your family, as you said, but then also then like, and what else are my um, other legacy that I want to leave to other people to make the world? Because we're all connected, right? So all of these nonprofits, all these 900 scholars are part of your family, you know, the, yeah. your extended I, family. I believe that too. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's really a beautiful story about, I think also it's a story about balance because, you know, oftentimes we want, we, we feel that pull towards spiritual meaning and then there's these obligations, you know, or jobs, obligations, sure. other responsibilities. How did you learn to balance those two things so that you're given both equal weight and importance? Uh It's a continual journey. Uh, when I uh, was 43, 44, uh, I decided to go back and get uh, training in psychology. And then I had to decide what that would be. And I ended up picking uh, Jungian psychology, but as a means to that end, I had to get a terminal degree in the field before I could become a, a Jungian analyst. So I had eight years to get a doctorate in clinical psychology. Wow. Uh, during that time, I had to be an analysis for myself. And I got to see a lot of the ways in which my unconscious story had impacted the way I was living my life, mm. including not being very balanced in some ways. Mm. So after uh, a lot of inner work and seeing this and trying this and trying that, I think I've evolved uh, over 30 years since then, uh, to have uh, a little bit more balanced life than I used to. Mm -hmm. It was interesting, Jay. I was kind of driven before I uh, did the Jungian uh, analytic work. Uh, and then when I got freed up from some of the stuff that was inside of me, I, I had some more energy because I wasn't binding certain things. But then I, I just uh, used that to run even faster. So <laughs> you know, the, good, the good news, the good, the good news was you know, I had more energy, but I wasn't necessarily using it to, for the balance. Uh, so I had to kind of figure that out. And it's just a uh, uh, hunting and pecking, you know, try this and do that. And, uh, and, uh, and as you have, you know, life scares and life changes and, you know, death uh, possibilities, it kind of relativizes. It has relativized my life. Mm -hmm. And so early on, I said I was grateful uh, these last couple of years that I am. And so I want to express that gratitude best I can to other people in other places. Well, wow, that, um, it, you know, so for me, I've always been extremely competitive and driven and, um, and I take that same kind of drive and competitiveness and, and pour it to something I care about deeply, which has been my spiritual practice. And so the funny thing is, is I'm, I'm, I'm relating to what you're saying with um, recent advice that has been given to me of stop pushing, stop pushing, stop doing, be more in being and allow the universe to unfold around you without all your efforting. It's very hard to do. It's ex I'm, I'm, I'm learning that now and I've been learning that over the last two years and I would say it's one of the hardest journeys because you have to unpack, like you said, that you did in your 40s, luckily for you. I think I probably started it maybe about, I've been working on this achieving, striving, accomplishment thing for a really long time. Mm -hmm. And it's now, um, I'd say upon like working eight years on this stuff, it's now working towards just stop doing, just be. Stop trying mm -hmm. to control things for expected outcomes that you believe are better. It's extremely hard to do. I don't know if that, is that what you were, I don't know about your personal journey. Is it similar or different than that? Well, no, a absolutely. Uh, a lot of uh, spiritual teachers that I know, uh, uh, they're as much alcoholics and, or Workaholics. Workaholics. Perhaps alcoholics. <laughs> I don't know. I, 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 that was a slip, but maybe not. But uh, <laughs> workaholics. 
you know, type A personalities mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and, and haven't necessarily lived that life work love balance uh, as much as they're suggesting some of the people they work with do. Mm. Uh, now that's just kind of a relatively small sample of mine, but that's, that's true. And I'm reminded of an experience that I had that relates to what you said. I was in Scotland uh, some years ago with my wife, and I'd just been diagnosed with atrial fibrillation. Mm. And I would go into AFib periodically. And so we were uh, in, the, in the room, and I, I had the AFib hit me. So I went into the, uh, the bathroom to do some Qigong to kind of, uh, you know, calm it down and, you know, work you know, through breath work and so on and so forth. And I haven't had this happen too many times, but uh, I heard a voice. I really did. And the voice said, be still and know that I am God. And the takeaway for me, be still. Carl, be still. You, know, you, don't, you don't have to do anything. Just be still. And uh, you know, I, I'm just echoing your trying to be supposed to do. And uh, it was a good reminder. And I re Mind myself of that. Uh, so I mean, car be still, just just be, and you can't get so hung up on making things happen, even though you may think it's really for the best of all things. Right. Sometimes you just have to let the thing unfold. And as you made the point, taking you eight years, I think for people to be really realistic, sometimes these takes a long, long time. There's no quick fix to that. You may get an insight like I did but then you're still programmed and robotically going through your life in ways that are really hard to, to make change, yeah. but, not impossible, but not impossible. What would Carl Jung say about um, subconscious beliefs and patterning that you pick up? Like, you know, I'm sure that both of us had picked up things from our families that said, sure. all right, CJ, you have to achieve, accomplish, get A's, you know, move forward, get the degrees, get the positional title. Like those were kind of like just bored into my brain. <laughs> <laughs> um, sure, sure. What did Young Young say, or Shaman, like your your guides tell you about subconscious programming and how you unwind them, those programs and thoughts? Uh, well, first, the work can help you understand what your programs are, uh -huh. and uh, 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 using Jungian terminology, maybe what archetypes you're identifying with mm. uh, that uh, uh, unconsciously are driving you. Mm. And so uh, once you know that, then you can avail yourself of the stories of people, what those archetypes are, and the stories of people who are possessed by them and how they turn out. Mm. So it gives you a little bit of a preview of a coming attraction mm. and what some antidotes could do. Mm. In, shamanic work, you may encounter a personification or some energy representation of that driven aspect of yourself mm -hmm. that you can dialogue with. You can get some information. Where did that come from? Where is it going? Mm -hmm. What's going and that's where people talk about lower world journeys mm -hmm. and upper world journeys where you know, the lower world journeys might be more referring to past things, mm -hmm. upper world journey, future things. So you can learn to journey around these themes to see if you don't change what's going to happen. Uh, uh, Jungian work also uh, has a teleological or future-oriented part that allows you to start thinking about that through your dreams and mm -hmm. through process like active imagination, which is akin to dialoguing, which I talk about in some of my books. Okay, got it. So um, the last thing I'd love to do is, is did, do you think you could step us through a, a exercise that would help us work through our unconscious programming? Uh, that might be a little big. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that may be too big. All right, how about the following? How about a blessing from your spirit guides? to help people who are, are um, suffering right now from um, this constant push drive and a cessation of, like, you know, fear of cessation from moving. Like, 
here's what I would I, I would say is that everyone wants the energy that I feel personally inside. And I think everyone is feeling is like, I just want this COVID thing to be over so I can go back to my old life as if our old life was that great. But we, <laughs> but we, we want to go back to our old life. Um, maybe asking your spirit guides, you know, the part of this that wants to keep on like consuming, taking, grabbing, going back to the old thing, being attached to those things, um, striving, pushing, um, what would maybe a blessing or advice from your spirit guides on how we can harmonize with the existing energies that are in the collective right now so that we can be at peace. You know, we all may be dying soon. You know, a, a fire could come through my house and destroy everything, including yeah. myself. I could die of COVID tomorrow. Like this, <laughs> I, I honestly, I hope none of those things happen, but it could happen. So the impermanence in life and how we can just be at peace with it. How about that? Can you deliver on that, Carl? <laughs> That's a big ass well, too. <laughs> uh, if you would want to work with it a little bit as well, and here's okay. how we can think about it. Okay. Uh, if, 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 uh, you ask in a relevant, good, big question. Mm -hmm. uh, so each of us might have some feelings right now, a rest of feelings, kind of a disease uh, feelings about our existential situation because of COVID. Mm -hmm. So, you know, kind of what we're kind of not at complete peace. So we have some part of us that that uh, is a feeling, some part of us, maybe some thoughts around it. So if you now, for example, could be thinking about what of what is this restive part of you? Uh, and then does it bother you? So you want to see what, from your conscious standpoint, what is... Okay, so I would say that if I were to identify it as an archetype or a spirit yeah. animal, it would be a squirrel. <laughs> okay. All right. So, so, so there's a squirrel in you that right now is, is kind of... Grabbing nuts cool. for the... Yeah. Every, every, everything, everything which way. Yeah. So if you were to kind of be able to visualize that, mm -hmm. that aspect of yourself, which is kind of taking every which way, and then you have to think, what question, if it could, if it could give you an answer, what would the question be that would help you learn something? For example, you could say, you know, uh, why right now am I so aware of you? Okay. Uh, what, what, what uh, message do you have for me? Okay. And actually, I mean, so, 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 and here, here's the, the move that, uh, uh, that's, uh, people can learn to do, but it's a tricky move. Can you become that swirl energy of you right now as you close your eyes and ask it, what message does it have for you that would be useful to you? Okay. So just let's both do this. What's your animal? What's your animal? I'm going to merge with a squirrel. How about you, Carl? What's up for you? What uh, animal would that be for you? It wouldn't necessarily be an animal, but uh, uh, I could just say it's a feeling of what can I do to become even more at peace with myself. Okay, so got it. it could be anything that you, you, you're taking that, uh, you're, you're personifying that, or anthrop you're, you're making it into an animal. Uh, I'm saying, uh, okay, what, what is that piece uh, of me that... Uh, and and that, who, uh, are you, who are you asking? Rest. Are you asking your higher I'm, self... I'm asking that piece of me that's feeling a little disquieted, a little restless. So, okay. it's a, however, uh, I'm, I'm saying we all have these parts. And you're saying people in COVID now are feeling all these things. I'm saying, well, let's try to have a relationship different than we've had with one of them. You're going to do the squirrel. I'll go with my feeling of uh, disquiet. Okay. Then I'm going to drum <laughs> while we do Perfect. this, just so there's no silence, okay? Just so it's not... Yeah. But, Not that this is going to make it weirder, but okay, ready? But, 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 but again, I might say the drumming is a doing. And as long okay, as so I'll doing, stop the doing. I'll stop doing. No, no, no. As long as the doing is serving you by getting you into a different place, that's good. But, but, but the important thing is to become the squirrel and have the conversation. For me, it's to become the disquiet 
and have the conversation. Should, do, you, would you, it interrupt you if I actually drummed, or is it okay? It's fine with me. Okay. I'm just saying for, for you okay. and this. So let's process. take everyone on a little journey. You ready? Yes. Okay, we called in the spirits. Um, I'm calling in the spirits to please help us during this journey to answer the questions that we have, which is why right now and what message you have for me. And we each will do our own process. Yes. Do you want to go first? That would be fine. Okay. Uh, this uh, sense of uh, disquietude or restlessness uh, had to do when it was talking to me with much about what we were saying that uh, I'm still doing and trying to uh, do things uh, as opposed to the being. But then I'm saying, well, but, but what does that look like? How can I change that? And uh, said, uh, the places that you go right now to do that, for example, I have uh, coffee in the morning in a little patio that has lots of flowers and things around it. it. says, you don't have to make this energy, we say, gigantic changes, but at the margin, spend a little bit more time there. And while you're there, remember some of the things that you're talking to other people about. Be aware how that place is looking at you just as you're looking at it, how nature is you know, looking at you as you're looking at that. Mm. Next thing, you know, when you're downtown, uh, you walk around the lake occasionally. Just do a little bit more of that. But the last thing it said, you know, when you're waking up at night sometimes, in the middle of the night, sometimes your mind's going to your to-do list and what you want to kind of do. Just take a little time in those moments to go to the places that, that, that feed you and, and kind of make you relax. For example, for me, that's often around water. Mm. I don't spend time in oceans now, but oceans are mm. powerful. But I, I do spend time on lakes. Mm -hmm. You know, go go to your lake. You know, go to the go to these places just in your mind's eye. Mm. So it's always remind the margin. And I, I I've learned that it's it, you don't have to sometimes make these big big changes. It's just kind of those little little changes that can make a big difference if you keep doing them. And so that was what my disquietude told me. Mm, beautiful. Um, for me, I was asking for the squirrel. And it, this, I said, I went over and I asked the squirrel to merge me with me. And it's like, nope. <laughs> I said, okay. And then I asked, the, the crow showed up, and which is one of my spirit animals. And I said, can I merge with you? And it said, yes. And mm -hmm. I said, um, um, why right now? And um, the message is that it is right now that we are all mm, asked to change. 
to really transform to our greatest self. And we're all given that opportunity right now. Every single one of us, you mm -hmm. know, you and what you're doing with your nonprofits and giving back and being so conscious about how you're giving and knowing that the world is bigger than just yourself. It's just one way um, to find yourself and your voice and where you fit within all of this. And I think all of us are being called to do that. And the crow, <laughs> I said, what message do you have for me? And, it's, and it was just showing me how the crow eats anything, right? The crow <laughs> eats garbage, <laughs> rotten yeah. meat. I, I, I'm yeah. just shocked. It's so ingenious about taking the most complicated, um, challenging scenarios and, and being clever about how to use those as opportunities to feed itself. And I think that, you know, I, I listened to the news yesterday and it was, it, it was just like, will someone please tell me something positive? You know, mm -hmm. Afghanistan, Haiti, you know, COVID. And I was just feeling so overwhelmed with all what, you know, which feels like garbage. Like I'm just admits a garbage of my mind, right? I've just thrown sure. trash all about mm -hmm. and um, to... Even amidst garbage, even amidst the seems like futile situations. I mean, we still, oh, wow, it hurts my heart thinking about this, but we still, we can still grow, learn, and help others. It doesn't mean that we just, you know, go flatlining and go despondent. It's about, okay, we're in this situation, what can we do to help others? How can we help ourselves? Maybe that other is ourself at this point, right? Sure. For me to take the garbage in my mind and do a good recycling and cleaning. <laughs> Maybe it's to help others do the same. I'm, I, I think it's all of the above. I mean, every single way, because I think that the, the hardest thing during these times is for someone who likes doing is asking, what can I do to change things? And it's not sure. necessarily changing things. It's accepting them as a normal state of what happens in life yeah. and yeah. to accept it and love it and um, be with it. And like the crow, like cleverly figure out what we can pick through to make, to feed us. <laughs> that's, that's my, that's my message from the crow. If that makes sense. Well, that's, that's a, a beautiful takeaway because, uh, Haiti would be a little difficult for most to do anything about. Afghanistan, similarly. COVID, maybe similarly. But uh, within our own circles, are there things we can do to make a difference? Absolutely. And as you started off with, can we do it for ourselves to make a difference? Absolutely. So if one can be motivated to do that and then get insight as to what to do, that's a big, big gift. Yeah, and and what's lovely is that yours was what to do. I mean, you're kind of, you're motivated, you have processes, and you got very specific what to do. It's incremental change. It doesn't have to be like, save the planet, you know? Go, and yeah. you know, you can you can walk around the lake. You don't have to walk the Camino. You know, you can, <laughs> you can do a small bit sure. and all those things because we're all connected. So when you walk and you notice during your breakfast um, in the garden, all those little things are check changing us on the collective level. So um, yeah, not to dismiss that whatever we do is not enough because every single thing, every little minutia makes a difference. So um, so that's my, my interpretation of what you said about you and my thought, <laughs> what the crow says back. <laughs> Oh, I love it. So we've been talking to Carl Greer about his book, The Necktie and the Jaguar, a memoir to help you change your story and find fulfillment. Thank you so much. Good to talk to you, CJ. Right, so I'm going to stop.